thank you very much and thank you very much for coming and uh, hope you enjoy the talk. I have lots and lots of slides. I'm going to put the, the slides up online. I'm not going to read all the stuff I have on the slides. So um, let's get going. So who am I? I'm, I'm Mark Lemberg. I've been with Python for a very, very long time. <clears throat> I'm, I'm the former chair of the Europe Python Society, um, also Python Software Foundation Fellow. Uh, I have my own consulting company and if you want to connect then this is the uh, LinkedIn QR code if you want to scan it, or you can go to the website down there, malemberg.com. Right, so <clears throat> motivation. So let's assume you're, you have the great idea for a startup, right? And you want to build the next big thing. Of course, what you need if you want to build something that's really big and you don't know how big it is going to get, you need to make a good choice about which database to use underneath, right? Now, if you've been in the business for, for a long time, then um, you probably know that there are quite a few you know, standard options that you have. But more recently, in the recent years, uh, there have been huge developments in the, in the space of databases. So if you go to this website, dbdb.io, which is a database of databases, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a quite useful thing because it compares the different databases, features, and so on makes it easy to, to have a look around and to shop around for a database. Then you'll find that there are more than 800 databases available for you to use now. So it's, it's not as easy to choose or it's not as straightforward to choose a database anymore. <clears throat> and the reason why this is, is that lots and lots of companies, especially the, well, what used to be the small startups and now are the, the big, huge internet companies, all those companies had an issue when they started their business because they, they found that the databases that were on the market at the time did not really fulfill the needs that they had. They weren't as scalable, for example. Uh, they didn't really focus on the specifics that they needed for, for their business. And so what they did is they started to, to take available open source projects and then customize them, modify them, and made them more scalable. So now you have lots and lots of different databases for different types of, of workloads that you want to handle. Of course, you can always go and just you know, pick the standard ones like MySQL, MariaDB, or Postgres, which is actually my favorite. Um, how many of you know these databases? <laughs> Everyone, excellent. <laughs> so those are the obvious choices, right? So let's assume you want to have something that you know, scales maybe a bit better than these databases, and uh, you, you are going to the market and you don't want to lose your competitive edge that you have in with your startup. So you probably have to approach this whole thing a bit in a bit more systematic way. So you have to answer a few questions about what you want to do with the database. Uh, you have to find out which features you need and then you have to go out and shop on the market to see what's available and then you know pick the best fit for, for your particular use case. Um, for larger projects, I would always recommend doing a POC as well, right? Because sometimes, you know, even though the, the, you know, the marketing slides of the different databases look nice, they may not actually perform in the way that are, they are being advertised for. So it's always a good thing. So first question is, what's the typical data load that you're going to have? What kind of work load are you going to put into the database? So there are basically two major different types. One is OLTP, online transaction processing, and the other one is OLAP, which is online analytical processing. How many of you know these terms? Okay, about half. So the, the first is basically mostly about what you typically do with a database, with a general purpose database. So you put stuff in, you edit stuff, you delete stuff. Um, data changes a lot in your database. Versus the, the second one, the OLAP case, is more about analytics. So you put in data into your database and you want to get reports out of it. And this is uh, also what Mauro talked about. Um, so you, what you first do is you, you collect all the data and then you put it into an OLAP storage to do the, the analytics and then do the, do the business reporting. So um, a typical use case for that would be a data warehouse solution. So once you have that figured out what you need, and it may actually be that you need two databases because you want to have both loads handled, and the typical case is that databases are only good at one of these. Um, of course, you know, 
the database vendors and the companies working on these things, they, they try to make both work nicely, but there's always a trade-off in these things. So you have to be careful of, um, you know, when choosing these. The next is you have to figure out what feature set you need from, from the database, because there are a lot of things that uh, you might need. There are also, unfortunately, a lot of things that uh, you may need in the future, but you don't have any clue of yet. You only figure out when you start developing. And so you have to plan for both the knowns and the unknowns when doing the selection. <clears throat> now, when it comes to the feature set, I, I put together um, you know, a few slides explaining different complexity dimensions that you have to consider when choosing a database. So I'm just gonna go through all of these. Um, this is not necessarily complete. You might have additional ones, so it, it basically depends on what you're looking for. The first one that you have to figure out is whether you're gonna have mostly simple schemas like you know, web server, for example, a logging server or something like that, or whether you, whether you want to have complex schemas. Let's say you're building a big, huge data warehouse that's supposed to handle all the, the data um, in, in your particular business, then it's more likely that you're gonna have a complex schema versus if you just want to do some quick processing, let's say you have a web shop to handle, then simple schema would be uh, more important for you. Now, when it comes to choosing the schema, this is probably fairly straightforward for you. What's not so straightforward is when making changes to those schemas. So you should have a database that allows you to implement migrations efficiently if you have a need for, for changing the schema afterwards, which you typically do. I mean, even if you know exactly what you want to do, at some point you're gonna find that you need more fields or more tables and you have to have these migrations. So the database should, should probably um, have features for these things. Next is, of course, cardinality. So how many, how many rows are you gonna store? How many are you gonna have tables with lots and lots of columns? Uh, what's called a wide table? Uh, or are you gonna have you know, both lots of rows, lots of columns? Uh, and of course, you need to figure out how fast is, you're gonna, is, is the data that you're gonna put into the data storage gonna scale? So how much new data are you gonna get every single month? And that's very important because uh, databases, they, they often, they, they hit a certain wall after, uh, after some time. They're not necessarily elastic in terms of scalability. So you have to be careful about that. Another point is temporal complexity. Maura already uh, mentioned that, uh, like for example, if you want to do time travel in your data. So you want to know what did my database look like on January 1st, you know, 2020. Um, that is a question that some databases can answer and others can. Sometimes you can you know, build something on top to make that happen, but this, is, this would be something that you would have to figure out before choosing a database. Um, right, next is query complexity, which is fairly obvious. So of course you want to, well, typically you want to have everything as performant as possible, right? So uh, performance matters a lot, but performance comes in two different um, uh, categories. So for o OLTP, it would be transactions per second. For OLAP, it's more important to know how quick is the database gonna answer my question. And this is especially important for BI reports that are that, that where the user doesn't want to wait like half a minute or so for the, for the answer. So that's something that's very important. Joints are very important as well. If you have lots and lots of tables, you denormalize uh, sorry, you normalize everything, so you basically um, use the dry principle for databases, um, then you typically have to do lots and lots of joins. Now, if you're working in the OLAP space, then it may be better to not, denormal, uh, to not normalize everything, but instead to denormalize certain things. Denormalization means that you duplicate data across multiple tables which of course is not dry, but uh, it makes the queries run faster because the database doesn't have to do all these joins on, on huge tables anymore. So that's something that you need to consider uh, as well and something that in, in, in recent uh, years has become very attractive is to use views for these things, uh, especially to if you are working in a larger organization, you don't want every single developer to write his or her own SQL, uh, select statements, but instead what you do is you prepare views on the data and then manage the views centrally and uh, make those available to the developers. Now, views are basically just hints for the database of how to do the, the uh, select statement, 
uh, but databases have now have materialized views as well. So they can dynamically turn the view on, a, on the data that you have into an actual table. And then the table is being managed by the database. Of course, you have to tell the database when to update that table every now and then. You can also do that using special indexes. Again, this is something to consider. Next is deployment complexity. So you want to know where to run your, your database, whether it's like on a single server, it's maybe a cluster, maybe you want to have something that works in Kubernetes. Um, you pretty much have all these options nowadays with databases. When it comes to storage, it's a different uh, question. So you have to know how much data you're going to put in into the database. Uh, if you want to have all the data all the data local to the engine, the database engine, then it's it's usually better to have something you know even in in, in memory or maybe on an SSD. Um, but the trend goes to basically separate compute from storage, so that you store everything on S3, for example, because that's a whole lot more scalable if you do a, a data lake, for example, and S3 is probably the right choice. Um, depends again on, on what kind of data you're looking at. <clears throat> Resilience and disaster recovery, very important if you're working uh, on a database that is you know, basically the basis for your, for your business. You want to make sure that everything continues to work even if the database goes down. Uh, or you, you know, have a disaster like, I don't know, data center goes on fire or something like that, then you need to figure out how that is being handled by your database. Operational complexity. So you have to decide whether to, you want something managed, so someone does the work for you, or you want everything self-hosted. There are pros and cons to these things. Uh, nowadays, most people tend to go to uh, managed services. So let's say you go to Amazon and then use a Redshift, for example. Um, then you don't have to worry about the, how the, the database is actually managed, how the hardware is con composed, or you use the self-hosted version, and then you have to you know, figure out what does the, the, the sysadmin, what do the DevOps teams need to know about? Are there integrations for these things available for your database? And then, of course, every now and then, you get a new database version, you have to handle upgrades, and you have to know whether you can do everything in zero downtime, whether that's possible or not, whether you can afford having you know, a bit of outage or not, and you have to basically make everything work in that kind of, kind of scenario as well. Right, those were uh, a couple of dimensions to consider. Like I said, there might be additional ones. Um, I also put up this slide with some additional decision factors. So what Mauro already talked about, it's, it's very important to figure out whether this, the, the uh, projects that you're looking at whether they're mature enough, whether there's going to be support for the next 10 years or so, right? Those are not necessary, for, especially for open source projects, those are not necessarily easy to answer. <clears throat> if you get a managed solution, like from Amazon, for example, uh, you can just ask Amazon for this, but if you use something like, uh, let's say, an Apache um, iceberg or so, then uh, the, the answer may not be straightforward. So um, I've, I've seen lots of these projects basically be hyped up very much for let's say five years or so, and then people lose interest and, and walk away and, and basically the, the projects, they, they die. Even though it may not necessarily be a bad project, but uh, people just you know go to other things. And of course, because you want to use Python, you should always look for good Python interfaces available for your, for your database. Right, so enough talking about you know the the theory behind it let's let's have a, an actual look at these databases so i just you know i'm going to show you a few selections different kinds of databases to to consider um, let's see how far we we can get in in the bit of time that we have so general purpose oltp databases you know the standard ones i'm not going to talk through these so you can get all of them to basically install on your own servers and you can get cloud versions of these as well more interesting in, in some use cases are in-memory databases. So basically where you run your, the, the whole uh, database inside memory, provided you have enough memory, of course. You can use SQLite for that. You can use DuckDB for that. SQLite is more OLTP and DuckDB is um, more OLAP. How many of you know DuckDB? Just a few. It's definitely something to, to uh, have a look at. It's a very new database. It's a very um, 
the it comes from academia, so they they actually put some really nice uh, techniques in there. Um, then there's a commercial one called Exasol. How many of you know that one? Oh, a few. That's nice. So uh, this is this is a bit different than SQLite and, and DuckDB. It's an it's an in-memory database. <clears throat> works in a cluster. And uh, the, the, the engine itself only works in, in memory. So it loads the data from persistent storage and then works in memory. It's extremely fast. Uh, lots of companies use Exasol, for example, for caching stuff. If you want even faster and you have a good budget <laughs> and, and you know a good link to NVIDIA to, to actually get those GPUs, uh, then you might want to use one of these GPU base databases. Um, I've, I cannot really say much about these things because unfortunately I don't have the huge budget to try these out, but um, they're supposed to be extremely fast um, and also extremely scalable. So HeavyDB is, uh, just got renamed, so it had two other names before, I don't remember. Uh, this is a very fast one. Uh, they are putting lots of energy into that. If you want to have something that works in the context of the Rapid stack or you want to work with Dask and Blazing SQL, uh, is something to look at. So uh, that's actually written in Python. So that's interesting. And there are extensions for Postgres, for example. If you're using Postgres already, you might want to have a look at that extension, and then, or you can use Scream. Uh, if you are more into, you know, doing analytics, ad hoc analytics, where you have to load lots of stuff in a very fast uh, way, and then do the analytics, and then basically you throw everything away again. So. Next is data warehouse OLAP databases. So again, all the big names like Snowflake, you know, BigQuery, Azure has something called uh, Synapse Analytics, um, Amazon has Redshift, Greenplum is a nice development. They are using uh, Postgres and basically extended that to, to work in a cluster, it does MPP, so massively parallel processing. Um, this is coming on strong. Teradata is one of the, the old timers in this field, so it's probably one of the first data warehouse uh, systems that you have. Nowadays, it's, it's basically just a cloud platform. It used to be a, um, a system where you basically have bought the hardware from them, appliances, and put those into your data center. All of these are column-oriented, which is something that most data warehouse uh, applications do, uh, because for OLAP, if you, have, if you store your data in a column, oriented way, then you can get at it much, much faster and do analytics much faster. Um, same goes for Data Lake. As, as uh, Mauro already mentioned, uh, Data Lake is basically you throw everything, all the data that you have or all the data that you can get your hands on, you throw into a system called the Data Lake database. Um, the storage is typically on something like S3 because you want everything uh, scalable. Uh, you often have to deal with unstructured data, so you can you have to be able to put that into your data uh, base as well. Like you can use Data Lake, for example, uh, to do this. Um, Apache has a nice database engine, which is actually just the engine, and then you plug in the storage later underneath. So you can use Data Lake, for example, with that. Um, Apache has Presto and Trino. Those are actually two projects which uh, forked at some point. So I can't really tell which, which of those two is the better one. I've heard lots of good things about Trino, so perhaps that's something that you might want to look at. Amazon has Athena for this, so you can basically throw everything at S3, and then you put Athena on top of it and do the querying. Now, <clears throat> if you want to do distributed databases, so you can use these for data warehouses or data lakes as well, um, and you want to put your database on, on lots and lots of cluster machines, and you want to have scalability, so horizontal scalability in your database, then these are nice uh, databases to look at. Uh, Jugabyte DB is, is, a, is a very you know, hot database at the moment. Uh, Cockroach DB is uh, basically a direct competitor to them. Um, the two are Postgres compatible, so if you have an application that already has a Postgres interface, then uh, those are good choices. And like I said, they're easy to scale. If you need more power, you just add more VMs to it or more containers. Um, if you have a need for MySQL compatibility, then single store is probably a good choice. 
Um, ClickHouse is a nice database. <clears throat> it's very fast, but um, it doesn't have all these SQL features. So some of these databases, they focus more on um, you know, specific things, like ClickHouse, for example, is good for log analysis. And then again, XSOL, uh, extremely fast and um, good for, you know, if you have lots of RAM. Right, that was um, it in terms of the classical databases. Then, of course, you have document databases. So let's say you have unstructured data or you have data that you have in, in form of JSON documents, then you can use any of these. So Elasticsearch, you probably know. OpenSearch, who knows OpenSearch? Just a few. So OpenSearch is basically a fork of Elasticsearch by Amazon. And that was done because Elasticsearch uh, changed the license, right? So um, Elasticsearch used to be Apache licensed and OpenSearch still is Apache licensed. Um, so depending on, on, on what you want to do, you can, you can use either one of those. Um, Cassandra is very nice. It's a very hot new data base for documents as well. It's high performance. You can use SQL to query it. <clears throat> Mongo, you all know, right? Uh, CouchDB is, is basically is more specific. If you have, like, let's say you have a mobile application, then CouchDB is, is excellent for doing the replication across devices. So let's say your mobile goes offline, it basically you store everything in CouchDB, and next time it comes online again, and then does the synchronization with your backend. So that's uh, that's good to to use. Time series always very important uh, for event data. So InfluxDB, you probably all know. Apache Druid, you might not know. How many of you know Druid? No, just a few. So that's a, a very, well, it's kind of new. It's extremely good for fast intake, similar to InfluxDB. Um, it was originally written for, for ad systems where you had you know, lots and lots of data come in and then you had to make you know, very fast queries to, to, be, to, to decide who gets to show you uh, an, an ad on a website. Um, CrateDB is interesting because it, it combines Elasticsearch for the document uh, side of things, and then it does Prestotrino for SQL. So that's something very nice. If you use Postgres, you can use Timescale, you can, which is an extension to Postgres. Um, lots of people are working on it. Um, I've heard lots of good things about it, so definitely something to, to look for. If you're more into a space where immutability is important or you have to prove that something happened in your database, let's say for auditing purposes, let's say you have a regulator uh, come to your company and then you know, check your records, then you should definitely have a look at, for example, ImmoDB, which, is, which also has some crypto stuff built in, so they actually sign the changes that you do in the database um, and then store that. Uh, or you can have a look at, at Apache Pino, which is it's append only, so you can just throw data at it and it will store it very fast. And then finally, machine learning and uh, databases. So how many of you are doing machine learning inside a database? <laughs> no one. <laughs> um, if you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense because the database already has all your data, right? So why move it out of the database to wherever and then do your Panda stuff on it or do your machine learning uh, models on it and then put everything back into the database again. So why not just you know, have everything happen directly in the database? Now with uh, Postgres and with uh, Greenplum, this is possible using the, the MAD lib. Um, so you can actually use all the, the libraries that you have for Python, but they will run directly inside the database server. So it's, uh, it's a lot faster, it's a lot more efficient. Other databases have support for this as well, uh, but you have to always then use UDFs for, for this. So you have to, you can write your UDFs in Python, for example, <clears throat> and then interface to, to these uh, libraries, whereas Matlib is already optimized for these kinds of things. Um, there's a, a special database, which is uh, kind of interesting because it works as a proxy to your, your uh, actual backend database. And, uh, what, what you can do there is you can actually do the machine learning inside SQL. So this is, this is nice for people who don't know Python, but who know SQL very well, um, as you have in you know, data engineers, for example. Many, many of them, they, they know SQL very, very well. 
and are feel much more comfortable with SQL rather than you know going to to Python to do the machine learning. And what they have done is they basically they parsed the SQL, they added extra elements to SQL to enable machine learning, and then people who then don't know Python can then use SQL to work um, in the machine learning space. So that's very interesting. Of course, there are lots of other things that I you know can't fit into the talk. Key value storages I haven't covered. There are lots of those uh, geodatabases. Uh, again, lots of those graph databases, Neo4j, for example. Vector databases, if you're, for example, storing machine learning models, then vector databases are a good thing to do. Uh, if you have lots of those, if you want to have, then have like a data catalog of all your, your models, then uh, those are something to consider. There are plenty of other use cases, very specific, um, so you might want to shop around a bit. Um, so this is everything I, I mentioned in this talk. This is just a small selection. Um, like I said, there are more than 800 databases out there, so I could only cover some of them. I hope this was useful. If you have questions, um, then please come to the mic. And I guess the main takeaway from the talk is you should never stop to learn and always try out new things, right? Okay, very good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So we have lots of time for questions. Um, if there are any in the room, please come to the mic and you'll give me a signal if there's any on remote. No questions. Excellent. I covered everything. So. <laughs> okay, very good. Then uh, once more. Okay. Good. Uh, this is a really good talk. Thank you. Uh, just want to hear your comment on the modern serverless uh, databases like pl plant scale and uh, of those type that are right now getting pretty hot. If right. you have used them or. I haven't used them, no, but uh, in, I mean, serverless is coming on strong, right? The, the problem with serverless is that it's, it's data locality. So <clears throat> even though you can, you can basically you, you scale up your, your compute, and uh, it's, it's, because it's serverless, you can even do that on demand, you always have to get the data to the engine, right? And so getting the data to the engine is the, is the bottleneck in those cases. If you have queries that don't need a lot of data, at the compute node, then I, I guess it, it works out fine. But otherwise, you, you introduce lots of latency because you have to get the data from, let's say, S3, for example, to that particular node and then run the query and then you know get rid of the data again. Great talk, thank you. Do you have any recommendations for graph databases? Graph, yeah, I would probably use Neo, Neo4j for that. And then that's basically the standard go-to kind of databases for graphing. Right. Hi, thanks for the talk. I uh, just wanted to get your opinion on maybe using a database outside of its intended use. So for example, like Elasticsearch, using it as maybe a reporting database. Mm -hmm. um, is that generally recommended or are there a lot of pitfalls that could um, it is specifically for, for Elastic, I think there are certain use cases which are which Elastic covers really well. For example, if you if you do lots of text kind of uh, oriented queries, then Elasticsearch is perfect for that. So e even though other databases, for example, Postgres has extensions for for doing text based search as well, um, because Lucene is uh, directly built into Elasticsearch, it has very very good features for for that particular space. So. If you're doing something like, for example, Elastic, the, the, I think the original use case for Elastic was to, to store log data from various different systems. And then you wanted to uh, query your log data based on the text that was written in the log messages, right? Because it wasn't always uh, very structured. Log messages can have various different you know, formats and, and, and syntaxes and so on. So uh, that made a lot of sense. And so if you, if you have a specific use case in that area, then you should definitely use Elastic for that or you know, open search one of these document databases. I, I wouldn't say that there's much of a pitch, pitfall there. Uh, Elastic is certainly scalable to you know, huge uh, data sets. So I think it's a good choice. Yeah, the other alternative I was looking at 
using Postgres, but the performance isn't quite there for the volume. Right. The performance was a bit better right. on Elasticsearch, but. Yeah, definitely. So if you have lots and lots of data, um, like LogDagger, for example, if you have like a terabyte log data, then yeah, I would definitely put that into Elasticsearch and do the query there rather than putting everything into uh, Postgres and then have one of these indexes uh, you know, built on top. Yeah. Thank you very much. Do we have a remote question? No, okay. I have one question before we go. Um, okay. I'm using Snowflake now at my company. Um, there seems to be a trend towards this kind of scalable uh, warehouse type setups. Do you right. see this as a sustainable trend? And are the other big monoliths uh, pivoting in that direction? Um, well, yeah, I mean, Slow Snowflake is like the go-to solution if, you, if you're if you in a company and, and, you're, um, and you want to do a data warehouse, right? So everyone picks Snowflake. Um, I'm not sure whether it's a good choice. I mean, it's certainly a very capable database and it was, uh, it's a new database. It was written from scratch. <clears throat> specifically for doing data warehouse uh, kind of uh, workloads. But, you know, it's just a single company and uh, you never know where that company is going to be in, in say, five, ten years. So it, it may be good to also look at other projects. Plus, if you have more specific needs in terms of performance, for example, there are some new Apache projects out there, like Druid, for example, which are actually a lot faster. So it's definitely worth uh, having a look at those things as well. Okay, thanks. So if there are no other questions, we'll end it there. Thanks, Marc-Andre. Thank you.